Welcome everyone. Um, we will get started with our program today. So you're, hopefully you're here for salamander season and you're ready to learn all about salamanders that we have here in Santa Clara County. So we're gonna start our program off today with a story that we're gonna read together. Um, it's a pretty short book, but I think that it's a great in introduction to salamanders and their habitats. Um, it's one of my personal favorite books. I think that it's a really fun uh, story with beautiful illustrations. So uh, listen along to the story. And then after that, we'll get into all of the cool facts and adaptations and where you can find salamanders. So uh, without further ado, the book that we're going to be reading today is called The Salamander Room. And um, I'm sharing my screen right now so that you'll be able to see all the beautiful illustrations up close uh, and read along with me at home if you'd like to. Uh, this book is written by Ann Mazur and illustrated by Steve Johnson and Lou Foncher. Uh, and without further ado, we'll get started on this book. I am found a salamander in the woods. It was a little orange salamander that crawled through the dried leaves of the forest floor. The salamander was warm and cozy in the boy's hand. Come live with me, Brian said. He took the salamander home. So we see Brian, it looks like he's in the woods and he lifted up a leaf and he found a salamander underneath and he decided he's gonna bring it home with him. Let's see what happens when he does that. Where will he sleep? His mother asked. I will make him a salamander bed to sleep in. I will cover him with leaves that are fresh and green and bring moss that looks like little stars to be a pillow for his head. I will bring crickets to sing him to sleep and bullfrogs to tell him goodnight stories. So we see him, he's tucked his salamander into bed in his little bedside table. And we see that bullfrog hiding behind the lamp. He's getting ready to, to go to bed. He's shutting that lamp off, saying goodnight to his salamander. And when he wakes up, where will he play? I will carpet my room with shiny wet leaves and water and water them so that he can slide around and play. I will bring tree stumps into my room so he can climb up the bark and sun himself on top. And I will bring boulders that he can creep over. So we see that salamander over on that tree stump, uh, all the leaves that he's spread all over his bedroom floor, some rocks for the salamander to crawl on. You can see under the bed, we have that bullfrog hiding there. He will miss his friends in the forest. I will bring salamander friends to play with him. And we see our salamander, he's looking out the window. He, I think he probably misses being outside. He misses his friends and his home. They will be hungry. How will you feed them? I will bring insects to live in my room. And every day I will catch some and feed the salamanders and I will make little pools of water on top of the boulders so they can drink whenever they are thirsty. So we see him watching his salamander uh, drink water from that boulder that he set up for them inside his room. The insects will multiply and soon there will be bugs and insects everywhere. I will find birds to eat the extra bugs and insects and the bullfrogs will eat them too. So we see he's all of a sudden letting some, some birds into his room. The bullfrogs are trying to eat all the bugs for him because he doesn't want to be overwhelmed by, by having bugs in his room, does he? Where will the birds and bullfrogs live? I will bring trees for the birds to roost in and make ponds for the frogs. So we see his room that he's made a lot of changes to in order to welcome in all these creatures, right? We see all of a sudden these big trees and a pond on his bedroom floor, leaves everywhere, bugs everywhere. It's starting to look a lot like outside, isn't it? Birds need to fly. We can lift off the ceiling. They will sail out into the sky, but they will come back to my room when it's time for dinner because they will know that the biggest, juiciest insects are there. So now he's lifted the roof off of his room 
And so he still has four walls, but his floor is covered in a pond and leaves. He's got trees. And now his room is completely open to the sky. What's gonna happen next? The trees, how will they grow? The rain will come through the open roof and the sun too. And the vines will creep up the walls of my room and ferns will grow under my bed. There will be big white mushrooms and moss like little stars growing around the tree stumps that the salamanders climb on. So we see a close up of that tree that's now in his room with all of the mushrooms and moss, the ivy growing up the, the sides of the room. And you, where will you sleep? I will sleep on a bed under the stars with the moon shining through the green leaves of the trees. Owls will hoot and crickets will sing. And next to me on the boulder with its head resting on soft moss, the salamander will sleep. And that is the end of our story. So what did we learn from that story? I think one of the things that I take away from that story is that you can you know, love animals from afar and want to, to let them live their lives in their, their natural habitat. So by taking a creature out of the wild, in order to make you know, your room like it's home, you'd have to make a lot of changes. And a lot of those changes aren't really practical, right? Um, that salamander is a part of a bigger system. And there's lots of interactions that that salamander has with other animals, with the birds, with the frogs with the moss, with the leaves on the forest floor. So taking an animal out of that system isn't gonna be good for that animal or for the, the habitat as a whole. So um, again, the name of this book um, is The Salamander Room um, and it's by Ann Mazur and illustrated by Steve Johnson and Lou Foncher. So I think that this is a, a wonderful book. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, and we're going to get a little bit more into what salamanders are. And um, after that, we're going to do a bunch of other activities and I'm going to have your participation throughout the program. So to kind of set that roadmap, um, since we've read the story, we'll talk about uh, what salamanders are, what makes a salamander a salamander, um, what ones do we have here in the Bay Area. We'll play a game uh, that tests your observation skills. And then we'll talk about uh, the important things that they do for us as people and for the environment, as well as some of the threats that they're facing and what we can do to help them. So what are salamanders? We you know, learned a little bit about that salamander and what it needed in its habitat from that book. We saw you know, an illustration of what one looked like from the story. Um, and I know from our chat at the beginning that a lot of people have already seen them before. Um, but I know that some people still have questions about what they look like. And uh, so what we're going to do together is we're going to have a shared experience where we observe one of these creatures in its natural habitat. And so what I want you to do, feel free to use the chat or you can um, talk to the people that you are with at home. Um, they're short video clips. And uh, I want you less focused on trying to figure out exactly what species it is. If you happen to know, that's great but really this is to practice our observation skills. So I want you to look for things like color, uh, the texture of its skin, how does it move? Uh, what does it use to move? Uh, things like that, you know? So I hope that you enjoy this exercise. I'm gonna play these clips. They do not have sound. Uh, when I saw these creatures in the wild, there was a big plane flying overhead. So the sound isn't uh, a relaxing nature sound. So we'll. We'll do this exercise right now. And so I'll play that first video clip. Right now, we're actually, especially because of the fire, it's going to be 
So hopefully you're making lots of really great observations. There were some slow-mo, so you, hopefully you were able to see those, those toes up close. Maybe you counted how many toes there were. Um, hope you enjoyed that. And we'll, we'll uh, talk about this specific species towards the end of our program. So don't worry um, about identifying it just yet. Uh, first, I want to identify for you all what a salamander actually is. And so um, on the right hand side, I have a very simplified uh, evolutionary tree. So scientists, biologists, they like to split things into groups based on uh, different traits that they may have. Uh, genetically, they like to put them into groups. So salamanders are vertebrates. So they have backbones, just like you and me, if skeletons. Um, they are tetrapods. So a tetrapod is something that has four legs. So you hopefully you were able to count those four legs in that video clip. Um, salamanders are also something that are called herps. So if you've ever heard of the study of herpetology, that's the study, the branch of science that focuses on um, amphibians and reptiles. So reptiles being things like um, lizards, turtles, crocodiles, snakes. Um, so herpetology is the study of amphibians and reptiles. Um, and then the root of that word herpetology actually means creeping thing or creeping animals. So when we think about how that salamander was moving, it was kind of creeping along the floor, right? Uh, salamanders are amphibians. So an amphibian, we'll talk about some of the characteristics of amphibians shortly, but if you are to, to look at the root of that word as well, it actually means double life. So salamanders uh, and amphibians in general, they tend to undergo um, some sort of transformation, metamorphosis, um, where they have a certain stage when they're younger and then they change into something else later, or they live on land and they also live on water. So salamanders are not um, reptiles. So you, we see our little salamander on our tree right there under that amphibian group. Um, they are not frogs either. And I'll talk about some differences in just a second. So uh, even though they look kind of like a lizard and they also kind of look like a frog, you know, cause they have that wet skin, they are not either of those things. So what exactly makes a salamander a salamander? So salamanders um, belong to this um, group called uh, Eurodella and um, it's an order and that's a grouping that scientists make. Uh, sometimes it's also called caudata and that includes all the extinct species that there are. Um, and that word actually means uh, tailed. And so uh, salamanders are tailed amphibians. So they're different from frogs because they have a tail for their entire life. Frogs have tails when they're tadpoles but they lose their tails when they become adults. So salamanders are tailed amphibians. They also, another characteristic of an amphibian is that they breathe through their skin. So oftentimes you'll notice on an amphibian that its skin is uh, kind of wet looking and sliming, slimy, and that's because they need to breathe through their skin. Um, some salamanders also have lungs, but most require um, their skin to be nice and clean and pristine so that they can breathe through it. Uh, some salamanders are terrestrial completely, some are completely aquatic, but a large majority live part of their life on land and part of their, their life in the water. Um, all salamanders need some kind of moist place to lay their eggs. So um, their eggs don't have an outer coating like reptiles do to protect them from the elements. Their eggs are more of a jelly. So in order to keep their eggs from drying out, they need to either lay them in water or find a nice damp, dark place to put them in. And then lastly, salamanders are carnivores. So they eat all sorts of insects, uh, invertebrates, uh, worms, earthworms are a favorite uh, snack for a lot of salamanders, slugs. Um, and then sometimes the bigger salamanders can actually eat other salamanders or they can uh, eat small, rodents, uh, which is pretty crazy to think about, but some salamanders get to be pretty big. Just to give you an idea of some of the diversity out there uh, as far as salamanders go, um, the largest salamander that's out there, we don't have it here. Uh, most of our salamanders in the United States are pretty small. They're more like four to, uh, four to six inches. We have some big ones, but 
not any that are nearly as big as the largest, which is the Chinese giant salamander, which can grow up to six feet, potentially weigh over a hundred pounds uh, and live for a pretty long time, 60, 70 years. Um, there was one that they found in a, in a really isolated cave that might've been even older than that. Um, so pretty incredible uh, kind of dinosaur looking animals. Uh, the smallest salamander out there is a type of a pygmy salamander. It's found in the cloud forests of Mexico. And it's very small. It's like about, you know, less than an inch. So if you were to think about a dime, um, that salamander could essentially fit on this dime. So a very, very small little salamander. Um, for me, one of the coolest salamanders, I think, is the axolotl. Uh, some people actually are able to have this type of salamander as a pet. It's a salamander that lives its entire life in the water, and it, it spends its entire life looking like the younger form of itself, that larval form. So it has gills, that's what those weird little things on the side of its head are, and it uses those to breathe. Um, and then the salamander also has really great regenerative properties. So when I say that, I mean that um, it's able to grow back all sorts of limbs and tissues um, like really well. So all salamanders have this ability to regrow um, not only tails, um, they go beyond tails. So they have a lot more um, ability to do this than lizards do. But the axolotl is one of the, the most well known for having this ability to grow those things back. So it's studied a lot um, for those features. Uh, one of the weirdest, I think, to me, just because of, of how it looks, is um, are the sirens. So they look kind of like eels. They've actually lost their back two legs. And so uh, they've spent their lives in water and in kind of turbid, muddy areas. Um, and they just are very slippery and uh, hard to find. So uh, just to give you an idea of some of the diversity that are out there in the salamander family. So how many different species are there in the world then? And so on this map, you can see all the places that you're likely to come across salamanders. And so one of the things that you might notice is that they're kind of more located on the northern um, part of, of the earth. Um, so they, they tend to like temperate areas and you're not gonna find nearly as many salamanders south of the equator as you are north of the equator. And that has to do with evolution and where the continents were and how they were able to disperse. Um, and so one of the, the largest places that you're able to find uh, salamanders is actually on the East Coast uh, in the Appalachian Mountains. So there, you can see that on the map there, we have that bright kind of orange and red spot. So that's where most of the salamanders on earth are located. In California, we're not too shabby. We have quite a few number of species. We have over 40. And here in uh, kind of the South Bay area into the Santa Cruz Mountains, we have around 10 species that you uh, might come across. And so for this next portion of the program, we'll go through those species together and you'll get to see photos and learn a little bit about uh, their lifestyles. So one of the first salamanders that I'm gonna talk about today is the arboreal salamander. So uh, like the name it kind of implies and gives away, arboreal meaning trees, these salamanders um, like to live in trees. They're really great climbers. So they actually have kind of elongated toes and their tail is adapted to help them climb. Um, so sometimes they might be located in cavities of trees or things like that. Um, they're a salamander that you actually might come across in your yard. Um, they're a common kind of backyard salamander. And uh, you're more likely, I think, to, to come across them if you're maybe, say, moving a, a pot, like a garden pot in your yard or, or something like that, where maybe they've been hiding underneath something that's kind of damp and, and uh, dark. And then you lift it up and you're like, oh, wow, what's that doing there? So uh, that's the arboreal salamander, most likely. They're about six to seven inches. So that's kind of like the average size of almost all of the salamanders that we have here in our area. Um, so this is a species of lungless salamander. So when I say that, what I mean is that they can only breathe through their skin and like the lining of their mouth. They do not have lungs like me and you. So they're not inhaling air, having it go to their lungs. They can't do that. They have to rely on their skin. 
to breathe and to take in that oxygen. Um, so because they um, are lungless, they actually spend most of their, their life on land. Um, they don't go to the water to breathe. Um, so they lay eggs on land, usually in uh, a small uh, kind of dark place. The eggs are pretty small. Um, and then when those eggs hatch, the salamanders are actually fully formed and ready to go. So if you think about um, the salamanders that lay their eggs in water, those salamanders have to transform because they need things that will adapt them to the water, like maybe a tail for, for swimming or a fin for swimming and gills. But um, when salamanders hatch on land, if they had uh, you know, fins or, or gills, that's not gonna be a good adaptation for land. They have to be ready to go, many little salamanders. So they hatch fully formed and ready to live their, their lives. Um, so our boreal salamanders are also nocturnal. So you might not come across them. A lot of our salamanders are nocturnal. Um, so you're more likely to come across them if you're outside at night. Um, the salamander does have a pretty strong jaw and um, it has sharp teeth. They're not teeth like you and me. Uh, they don't use their teeth to chew food or anything like that. Uh, it's more to grab on to beetles and not let them slip away. But it's enough of uh, these little cone-shaped teeth that if you picked them up, they could bite you and, and draw a little bit of blood. It's not gonna hurt you, you're not gonna die. Um, I mean, it'll hurt a little bit, but uh, you just wanna give them space and leave them alone. Um, next slide. So our slender salamander. So this is another very, very common salamander, maybe more common than the arboreal one, another kind of backyard species. They like to hide under um, you know, little pieces of wood. So if you flip one over, maybe in your yard, you might see this little thing that is either coiled up or starts to like writhe and it almost looks like a little worm. Um, they're also lungless. So they use their skin to breathe. They do not have lungs. They lay their eggs on land and the little salamanders hatch fully formed. So um, these salamanders are small, um, three to five inches. So when their, their salamanders hatch, they are teeny tiny, probably about the size of like your fingertip, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, so really small, and then they eventually grow into their full form, which is about three to five inches. Um, in addition to backyards or under pots and things, uh, they're in woodlands, grasslands, um, and then that coiling is uh, what they do in defense. So uh, a cute little salamander, its legs are super small and it definitely looks kind of like a worm to me. Sometimes they're called worm salamanders. The yellow-eyed and satina. So this is another salamander species that you might encounter if you're hiking in a park. This isn't a, necessarily a backyard species. Um, they're the same kind of average size, three to six inches. They're lungless. So again, they are breathing through their skin. They do not have lungs. Um, they lay their eggs on land. Their eggs um, hatch into fully formed little salamanders. Um, so mixed forests, uh, evergreen, anywhere where on the forest there's lots of kind of woody de debris that they can hide under so that they don't dry out. Um, if you look at its body, you'll notice that its legs are relatively long in comparison to some of the other salamanders that we've looked at. And its tail is kind of unique too. It almost looks swollen to me and it's pinched at the base. And so um, that tail actually, believe it or not, can pack a punch. Um, the salamander does have poison in its tail. So if it feels threatened, it can secrete this milky toxic um, poison from its tail to kind of ward off predators or make them, you know, the predator spit it out. Um, but one of the main things that this salamander relies on for protection is that bright coloration. So it's this bright orange color, which in nature, bright colors often mean stay away. You don't want to eat me. Um, and actually on that bottom right photo, you can see we have our Encetina right here. And that's a baby Encetina, a juvenile. And then this guy right here is a cousin, a relative that is very, very toxic, the California newt. And so the Encetina is trying to mimic the newt um, with that orange coloration, but they look pretty different. The newt has kind of this rough skin and the Encetina looks more shiny and smooth. So that's some of the ways that you can tell the difference. Uh, really quickly, I just wanted to mention a couple more species that are around the area. You're not as likely to come across them. 
One of them is the Santa Cruz black salamander, another lungless salamander, lays its eggs on land, they hatch fully formed. You'll be an expert by the end of this presentation. Um, they prefer coniferous forests and uh, this salamander uh, for defense likes to make the, his mucus very sticky. Um, and then it'll also kind of posture in a way that either, you know, makes predators want to run away or makes, try just to make itself look big. Um, unfortunately, this species is a species of special concern. So a lot of amphibians are, are facing a lot of threats and I'll talk about that towards the end of the program. So this is one that in the state of California, um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is trying to keep an eye on and trying to determine, you know, if it's habitat loss or if the population is declining. So they're aware and they, they just want to watch and see kind of what happens and protect it a little bit. Um, the California giant salamander is one of my favorites. Um, it's our biggest salamander that we have in the area. It can be up to a foot long, very, you know, a big salamander. Um, these are lunged salamanders. So uh, in addition to breathing through its skin, it actually has a pair of lungs, kind of like you and me, it breathes in air and takes that oxygen in from its lungs. Um, these salamanders prefer kind of damp forests, uh, areas with like redwoods uh, and streams that are fast moving. In order to lay its eggs, it really prefers uh, fast moving streams with a lot of water. Um, it breeds in the water and then its larvae go through metamorphosis. They transform before ultimately becoming, um, having you know, legs and the ability to breathe on land. Uh, this salamander can bite pretty hard and it actually is one of the few salamanders that will vocalize and kind of bark, um, have this, this rattling chatter um, if you threaten it or if it feels threatened. Uh, the salamander has a voracious appetite. It eats all sorts of uh, kind of bigger prey. So uh, banana slugs are one of the foods that you'll often see pictures of it eating, which is kind of like a slimy mess. Uh, and then also small rodents um, the salamander can eat. So uh, wider diversity of food than our other salamanders. And again, this is a species of special concern. So facing habitat loss or population decline and California Department of Fish and Wildlife is keeping an eye on them. Um, two species that unfortunately are doing even worse and um, are federally protected and endangered, not only in the state of California, but but uh, on a national level are the California tiger salamander and the Santa Cruz long-toed salamander. Um, the California tiger salamander is probably one that you've heard about before. It's the one that all of a sudden they'll find uh, some breeding salamanders in a random pond on a piece of land that's about to be developed and they'll have to completely stop um, building because the salamander uh, really needs to be able to, to grow and for those uh, baby salamanders to grow up. So. California tiger salamander, you've probably heard of it before. Um, both of these salamanders are in the mole salamander family. So kind of like the name gives away, these salamanders like to be underground. So they spend most of their life in burrows, especially their adult life. So you're probably not going to see them um, in their adult form. Uh, they rely on uh, other animals to kind of dig most of their burrows for them. So animals like squirrels, pocket gophers, things like that. And so uh, in order for them to have good habitat, there needs to be an active kind of squirrel or pocket gopher population to keep those tunnels, you know, nice and, and great for crawling around in um, and stop them from caving in and things like that. Uh, these are lunged salamanders, so they breathe through their skin and their lungs as well. They have aquatic reproduction, so they lay their eggs in water. They go through metamorphosis before leaving the water. Tiger salamanders are, are found in kind of a different type of habitat from other salamanders, usually kind of these open grasslands. Um, if you go to a park that has uh, grazing, oftentimes that's a great place for tiger salamanders because they uh, like to breed in the uh, cattle ponds, those kind of seasonal ponds, because they don't have to worry about fish or other predators that might eat their larva. Um, the Santa Cruz long-toed salamander, I included this one. It's not actually one that's found in Santa Clara County, but it is found in Santa Cruz County. Um, so I wanted to include it because um, it has a similar lifestyle to the tiger salamander. It needs to, to live underground as an adult. Um, but this one prefers more riparian areas and coastal scrub. So um, if you think about Santa Cruz, 
closer to the to the ocean and some of that coastal scrub is where this salamander tends to live. So salamander versus newt. I haven't even talked about newts yet. And maybe you're wondering, uh, what is the difference between a salamander and a newt? So one way to put it is to say that all newts are salamanders, but not all salamanders are newts. Still kind of confusing. I think to me, it almost sounds like a word problem. Uh, but uh, maybe an easier way to think about it is if you were to say something like, all apples are fruit, but not all fruit are apples. Maybe that helped a little bit. Here's another way uh, that you can think about it. So salamanders, when you say salamander, you're referring generally to this larger grouping. Remember we talked about how scientists like to put things into different categories and groups. So salamanders, that's tailed amphibians, is kind of the larger term. And then underneath it, we have all of these different smaller groups, which are called families. And so newts belong to this one specific family. Um, and then we have all these other families. So if you look at all the other names really quickly, you'll see that we've already talked about a lot of them. We've talked about lungless salamanders. We talked a little bit about mole salamanders. We talked about the Pacific giant salamander. I mentioned sirens and giant salamanders during my uh, diversity uh, little piece at the beginning. So newts are a specific subgroup, essentially, of this larger grouping of salamanders. So hopefully that straightens it out a little bit in your brain. Um, but there are some differences that you can notice if you're out hiking. So uh, newts are actually the species that you're more likely to come across in county parks than any other uh, salamander. Uh, Newts are usually active during the day, whereas most of the other salamanders are more nocturnal. Um, so you'll probably see these slow moving creatures, that, that was what my video was at the beginning, making their way across the forest floor. And so we have three species here in the Bay Area. We have the California newt, the rough-skinned newt, and the red-bellied newt. And that was the order, California newt, rough-skinned newt in the middle on that right-hand photo, red-bellied newt on the right. And so the main thing that you can notice when it comes to newts is that they have really rough, bumpy skin when they're on land. Um, and they also tend to have this really bright coloration that's only on their belly. Um, newts will breed in water. They have aquatic larvae. So usually they're making their way to ponds to breed when you see them. So if you see giant groups in the water, that's, um, I'll talk about that in a little, in a little bit, um, but you're more likely to, to encounter them on land. Rough-skinned newt and the California newt look very, very similar. Um, these two species will trip up even the, the best biologist. Um, sometimes they look really, really crazy similar. Um, the rough-skinned newt is a little darker on the top. And um, if you look underneath its eye, um, the strip of the, the dark coloration kind of goes underneath the eye, almost like a smoky eye. Whereas the California newt, it's more of a lighter color underneath the eye. Um, if you look at their actual eyes from above, the uh, rough skinned newt, the, the eyes kind of blend in with the side of the head, whereas the California newt, they bulge out a little bit more. Another way that you can tell, and unfortunately you never want this to happen, is if they feel threatened, they will um, show their undersides. So, with the rough-skinned newt, it's going to curl its tail when it does this. The California newt is going to curl up but keep its tail straight. So if you ever see a newt doing this, you know that you have, you know, made it feel not so great and you should give it some space. Um, but they're doing this because they want to show off that bright coloration to predators to say, I am toxic, because bright colors in nature often mean that things are toxic. And I'll talk about that toxin next. But the rough-skinned newt is 10 times more toxic than the California newt. So you want to do your best to identify the rough-skinned newts and uh, really know that you should not be handling or touching those species because uh, it's not going to be so great for you. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. You don't need to worry. Um, rough-skinned newts do not have a state or federal protected status, but California newts are a species of special concern. So there's something that fish and wildlife are, are paying attention to and want to make sure that their numbers aren't declining. 
Um, the red-bellied newt is another species of newt that is in the area. It's not nearly as widespread and it's really limited to the Stevens Creek watershed. And there's an interesting story about this newt where it wasn't found in this area or really known about in this area until about 10 years ago when um, a, a volunteer who noticed these red-bellied newts and alerted a biologist. Um, but until that point, really the only known red-bellied newts were located 80 miles north of here in Sonoma County. So how they got to Stevens Creek is kind of a mystery. We don't know if they have existed there for a while or if someone released a population. They're native to California, but they just hadn't been seen in that area for a really long time. Uh, they're about the same size as our Californian rough skin newt, about the average size, six inches but they have completely black eyes and um, a red belly. So they do look pretty different. And then when threatened, they do not curl their tail or lift it, um, kind of like the, the California newt. We see our California newt here, a red bellied newt here. Toxic, so I've been saying that a couple times. Maybe you've heard they're toxic before. What do you need to be worried about when you see these creatures in the wild? So it's important to know that um, that they're toxic. And so this means that you should observe them and you can look at them, but you really should avoid touching them. Uh, and definitely do not kiss their cute little faces at all costs uh, or eat them. If you eat one of these newts, uh, unfortunately you will not make it. They, when something is toxic, it means that if you ingest it, if you bring it into your body, then, um, then you will have harm. Uh, it's not venomous. It's not like a rattlesnake where when it bites you, it's envenomating you and, um, and that it'll spread that way. Whereas you can uh, touch a rattlesnake and as long as you don't get bit, you're not gonna you know, have that, that venom enter your body. But with newts, the toxin is located on their skin. So by touching them or, uh, or eating them, that's how it's gonna get into your body. Touching them, holding a newt, I know you saw in that photo, there was a person holding all three newts. Um, if you have a cut or an open wound on your, on your hand, that's how the toxic is going to enter your body. Um, with a rough skin newt, even just handling it sometimes can make your hands start to feel numb or tingly. Um, but uh, so I really just ultimately would recommend not handling them because it's hard to tell them apart. And if you accidentally touch your eyes or touch your mouth without washing your hands, it's, it's not really gonna be the best for you. So that toxin is a neurotoxin and it can have a lot of not so great effects. Um, you will feel this burning sensation, numbness, it can lead to paralysis and then ultimately death. And they are one of the most toxic creatures that we have in North America. Uh, that rough skin newt has enough toxin to kill over 25,000 lab mice. So, um, these are, are creatures that most things do not want to eat and that coloration warns them and tells them to stay away. Uh, garter snakes are one of the few uh, creatures that can eat newts and that's because they have developed an immunity to or res resistance to that toxin. Um, a lot of scientists call it an evolutionary arms race because the newts start to become more and more toxic but then the garter snakes try to keep up. Uh, but there's this trade-off that happens because the more toxic a newt gets, maybe the, the less reproductive success it will have, maybe the less eggs it'll be able to lay. So you never want to do more than you have to. And then the same goes for the garter snake. It doesn't want to be too resistant to the toxin or else it actually makes the snake slow and it won't be able to crawl across the land as well and avoid birds and things like that. So where would you expect to find salamanders? I'm gonna launch a poll really quick. Um, and based on what we've already talked about today, um, I'm curious to see if you've already picked up on the type of habitat that is best for salamanders. So feel free to vote, just do your best. Um, these answers are anonymous. And then I'll talk a little bit about where you would expect to find them in county parks. All right, I will share those results. So it seems like a lot of people uh, voted for forest with flowing water, which is great. That is definitely one of the most common places that you're gonna come across newts here in the Bay Area. Grasslands with seasonal ponds was a close second, which is another 
awesome habitat for salamanders here uh, in the Bay Area. Caves are underground is a great answer as well. So we had our mole salamanders. Um, and then caves, there are some salamanders that like to exist in caves. I know that there's a species, I think, of um, the Pacific uh, giant salamander that actually exists in a cave in Santa Cruz. Um, and there are other species of salamanders as well. Uh, we had a couple of, of votes for dry and hot ocean and South Pole frozen areas. And these are all in some way correct as well, but they're not going to be the preference for these salamanders. So um, in order for a salamander to exist in a, in a desert, and some do, they need to have some sort of water. So usually if, this, if a salamander exists in a desert, it's because there's either rainfall that happens a certain time of year and then they can hide the rest of the year. Ocean, most salamanders really are gonna prefer fresh water. So um, there aren't any salamanders that exist in the ocean, but there is, I think, one species of salamander that can exist in, um, in a type of salty water. Um, and then frozen, if you think of all the salamanders that are on the East Coast, um, you know, it snows on the East Coast. So they need to be able to get away from, from that uh, cold and have adaptations for that. So um, it's not outside the question to think that they'll be in a frozen place, but there are not actually any salamanders in Antarctica. So I will stop sharing those results. And um, just really briefly, here's a, a photo of some great salamander habitat. So this is Stevens Creek. Uh, this was just a couple of days ago. Right now the creek's pretty low, but we do have a bunch of rain coming. So um, the salamanders are definitely starting to be out and on the move. So they prefer fresh water. So whether it be creeks, ponds, lakes, streams, um, things like that, they prefer usually um, shady forested areas. So they breathe through their skin. They need to make sure that their skin stays nice and wet, that they don't dry out. So if there's shade, it's, it's a lot better for them. They like to have lots of hiding places. So again, they don't want to dry out. So whether that's under a leaf, under a rock, or a log, in a burrow, inside a tree cavity, anywhere that has cover for them, they don't want to be exposed. And then also a place to reproduce. So depending on the type of salamander, that could mean having a pond to, to move to. It could mean having a nice damp little rock to lay their eggs under. So just having a place also to reproduce is going to be important. Uh, so for this next portion, this is when we're going to play a game together. So if anyone here has ever played the game Where's Waldo, then uh, you're going to have maybe some experience with finding something in a hard to find place. So the way that this is going to work is I'm going to give you um, about uh, 20 seconds to look for a newt. And then after that 20 seconds, I'll narrow the search field a little bit and see if you can find it within that time. And then I'll circle the newt for you that is hiding um, in its habitat. If you find it and you want to raise your hand and let me know, um, I'll just, I just, I'm curious to see how fast everyone is at finding these newts because you will find out that they are pretty camouflaged. So without further ado, let's start our game. But before we do, actually, I want to give you a taste of what uh, is going to happen when you look for these newts. I have some footage of a newt finding its hiding place. Um, and it's pretty interesting to watch. So see that spider at the bottom. I didn't even notice that when I filmed this, but we have our California newt going under those leaves. I can tell that it already, you know, matches with those leaves, but watch what it does. It starts to kind of tuck itself under that leaf. And to me, it seems almost like it is, um, mimicking the shape of the leaf. I don't know that it did this on purpose, but um, if you're walking across the forest floor and you're not being careful, you might step on a newt. So it's always you know, best to, to take your time. So I'm gonna start our timer. And I'll lower the, the field, so raise your hand if you find that newt. All right, I've narrowed the field a little bit. See if you can find it now. And there is our newt. Awesome. So if you want to lower your hands really quick to get ready for the next one. Now that you know how it's going to work. All right, here's our next newt. Raise your hand when you find it.
All right, lower those hands when you get the chance. We have one more new camouflage to try and find. Raise your hand when you find that newt. All right, see if you can find it within this search. Victoria, maybe we give a couple more seconds for this one. I think the yeah, slides I just are a bit saw the comment. I apologize if this is going too fast. There's a, a delay for me since this is in webinar mode. So sometimes the slides uh, like skip ahead. So I apologize if that was not enough time. And there's our newt. All right, so hopefully from that little exercise, you got an idea of just how well these creatures blend in. So I'll, I'll put it up so that you can see this environment. So all sorts of different leaves, sycamore leaves, maybe some fig leaf maple leaves, um, and that salamander blends in almost perfectly uh, to its surrounding environment. It's only when it, it shows its belly that it would start to stand out. And so the top of those California newts help it camouflage but when it needs to display that it's toxic, it can show its belly. So kind of interesting having both features. But when is the best time to see salamanders and newts? So when it comes to salamanders, most of them are um, nocturnal. So you're more likely actually to see a newt, especially in county parks. And uh, the rainy season is when you're going to see them. So that goes from uh, from December through April. So especially right now, the rains have really just started. After this week is gonna be a great time to walk around in county parks and see newts. Uh, why are they coming out during that time? So they spend a lot of their time uh, underground or in burrows, under leaves, kind of just waiting for the dry season to be over. And once they hear that kind of pitter patter of rain, they come out of their little hiding places and they start to move towards the water. And the reason why they move towards the water is to breed. And what tells them to move towards the water is actually a hormone that starts to be produced in their body. It's called prolactin. And it, when that hormone is produced, they have this incredible urge to just get to the water where they were born and try to breed. So that's what drives them to the water. Um, they are using their sense of smell. And in some cases, I think the stars in order to navigate to their uh, natal pond where they were born. And it's sometimes a long journey. These salamanders can travel up to two, two, three miles to get to their pond. Um, if you were to turn that into uh, people miles, if we were to walk that, it would probably be the equivalent of 20 to 30 miles. So these creatures, they're very small, they're navigating sometimes steep terrain um, and they're doing their best to get there even though it's a long way. Uh, when they get to the pond, they are breeding. So when it comes to salamanders, Usually the males are the first to arrive. Um, they get to be pretty beefy, so their legs uh, get all, and their arms get kind of pumped up. Uh, it looks like they've been lifting at the gym. And uh, the reason why their, their arms get big is so that when the females arrive, uh, they can grasp onto the females. They do kind of this mating dance. And if the female uh, likes what she's seeing, she'll follow behind the male and pick up a little packet of sperm. And she will use that to fertilize her eggs. And so those eggs will eventually hatch. The timing depends on uh, the conditions, the temperature, uh, the nutrients, things like that. And uh, when they hatch, eventually they'll have their, their four legs and then they'll develop lungs and they'll lose their, their gills and they'll be able to leave the land um, and go up into a hiding place to wait for the next uh, rainy season. Or at least for juveniles, it might take a couple of years for them to be uh, mature enough to reproduce, but they'll, the males and females will leave the water and uh, wait for the next rainy season. So uh, now is a great time to see them since they're they're making their way to breed. Um, and if you see them in your in their pond, uh, oftentimes you'll see these kind of newt balls, and so um, they're just all trying to to show the females um, that they're the best uh, male to mate with. So. Uh, sometimes they look like these giant kind of writhing balls with, yeah, thousands of, of newts and things like that. 
So what do salamanders do for us? Um, salamanders are really important for all sorts of things in our ecosystem. They are huge for pest control. So if you think about all of the things that salamanders eat, all sorts of bugs and other invertebrates, um, they can eat you know, things that we don't necessarily like, like ticks or mosquitoes, mosquito larvae. So they keep those pests that we don't like away. Um, salamanders are also a really important food source for some uh, other animals, maybe birds, raccoons, depending on the species of salamander and, and whether they're toxic, but especially on the East Coast where we have all those salamanders, they are an, an important part of that ecosystem and how everything is related and functions. They're important for nutrient cycling as well. So based on all the creatures that they eat and then subsequently poop out, they're returning nutrients to the soil. So uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, they're really important for keeping the soils um, healthy and stable in our ecosystems. Uh, salamanders and whether they're present tells a lot about uh, the status of that habitat and whether it's healthy um, because they're really sensitive to things like pollution or drought. So if there are no salamanders in an area, we know that there's probably something wrong. They raise the alarm essentially. And then advancements in medicine. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, salamanders have really great regenerative properties. So scientists are actually studying how salamanders are able to um, regrow these limbs. And they're gonna try and say, figure out if they can apply that to people. So maybe someday we'll be able to regrow a lost arm. But realistically, in the short term, it's probably more likely that they'll be able to do things like repair eyesight or um, improve the, the healing speed of wounds and things like that by studying salamanders. So what threats do salamanders face? Um, unfortunately, salamanders and amphibians as a whole are um, in trouble. Uh, world, or, yeah, worldwide, uh, at least 40% of salamanders are um, either in, in threat of going extinct or it's you know, affected in some way and not doing so great. Um, half the species that I mentioned today locally have some state or federal protected status. So we're aware that their populations aren't doing so great. And there are a handful of reasons for this. One of them is habitat loss. So as people build um, houses, uh, shopping malls, roads, dams, um, trails, things like that, we are entering salamanders habitat and um, taking it away from them or uh, making it more difficult for them to return to their, their ponds or to find food and things like that. Um, invasive species, so in places where people either um, release a, a fish species that might eat the larva of a, a salamander or, um, or frogs, like bullfrogs will eat a lot of the, the larva of salamanders. So, there are other animals that can be released and outcompete salamanders or eat salamanders, and then their numbers decline. But probably one of the, the worst things that's facing salamanders right now is a fungus that causes uh, skin infections in salamanders. And we know how important from what I've talked about their skin is for them to breathe. So um, it's not yet known that this uh, fungus has reached the, the North America. Um, but US Fish and Wildlife is keeping an eye on it and wants to make sure that you know, if it reaches our amphibians that um, it, it doesn't spread or our salamanders that it doesn't spread because um, it has the ability to wipe out 100% of specific species and it has done that in places like the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, so specifically, and I know I saw in the comments that uh, about the salamanders at Lexington Reservoir. And so this is a, a county park that's surrounded by a bunch of different uh, land owners. And so um, unfortunately, this road uh, saw a lot of salamanders that were being run over by cars. And it was a, a volunteer who was able to notice this and uh, kind of raised the alarm and, and tracked her observations. And because of that, there's actually a, a giant collaboration with a bunch of agencies to figure out what's going on there and uh, try and find a solution, whether that ultimately ends up being uh, fencing to direct them off the road or uh, special crossings to help them either get under or over the road. Um, they're trying to figure out exactly what's going on there. So it's always great to, to pay attention to what's happening in you know, any kind of habitat and uh, to let people know if you notice something that isn't so great. 
So there's more information about this study um, that you can find online on uh, MidPen's website. I think Rachel will share the link in the chat. Um, I know we're running low on time, so I wanna make sure we have time for question and answer. We're pretty much at the end. Um, I know one of your burning questions is probably where can you actually see the salamanders? There are a lot of county parks where you can see salamanders and newts. Um, I've circled a handful of my favorite places on this map. Um, Stevens Creek is a great place. Mount Madonna and uh, Sanborn are great places to see newts. Lexington Reservoir, but you know, be mindful if you travel to Lexington, there's newt crossing signs there. Drive slow, watch where you step. Um, uh, other places, Coyote Lake Harvey Bear Ranch is another great place to see salamanders. So they, they are scattered about, but um, I think most of the parks on kind of the west side of the map are some of the best places to see salamanders and newts. So if you go to a county park, you look at the trails, see if there's a trail that goes alongside a creek, and you'll probably run into some newts. And then really quickly, some things that you can do to help uh, the salamanders. Remember to slow down, especially when you're driving to parks, if you see a newt sign or something like that, a newt crossing sign. Um, don't pick them up, uh, don't bother them, kind of leave them alone, observe them from afar. Um, it's, you're not allowed to take a salamander home as a pet. It's better to leave them in the wild. Uh, keep our county parks clean, don't pollute. We know that salamanders are sensitive, they need to breathe through their skin. So it's important that we keep their waterways clean. Uh, don't release your pet salamander into the wild, especially with that salamander fungus that's uh, threatening our salamander populations. And then lastly, uh, participating in citizen scientists. There's citizen science. So like um, that volunteer who trapped the salamanders who were unfortunately getting run over by cars at Lexington, you can observe salamanders, um, take pictures of them, share their information, uh, you know, with other people so that scientists can keep track of how these species are doing. So that is the end. We're two minutes over and I know that uh, people have lots of questions. So um, I'm going to open it up for questions and hopefully if there's anything that I've, I've missed that if there's any questions out there that address those things, uh, we can cover them. So uh, thank you for joining me today and I'll let Rachel hop on and go through the, the question and answer for me. All right, we have many, many great questions. So the one I'll start off with is, are salamanders affected by poison oak or ivy? That's a really great question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I would think that they probably are not affected by poison oak or ivy, but that's a question that I'll have to, to look up. That's an interesting one. Um, yeah, I don't know if they're their skin, like the mucus that's on their skin would protect them or not. So great question. I don't know the answer. Great question. Okay, let me move on to the next question. Um, how did all the big fires affect the newts and the salamanders? So I think in a lot of ways, it's, it's too early to know exactly how the salamanders were affected. There are a couple things that can happen um, with big fires like that. So, um, like first off, if you think about salamanders and how long they've been on the planet, they've been through fires, they've been through all sorts of mass extinction events. Um, but the thing with fires is that uh, when there's a really large fire that completely decimates an area, things can happen to the landscape, especially when we have uh, rain that happens all at once, like it's about to happen right now, uh, where there's erosion, um, there are streams that could potentially be silted in, covered with sediment and buried. Um, maybe the salamander all of a sudden isn't able to navigate across the landscape as well as it once was able to. Um, so I don't know exactly how the salamanders are gonna do after this most recent fire. I think that's something that scientists are gonna have to keep an eye on. Um, they have adapted to survive fires over the years. They can either you know, try and bury themselves underground or um, they're not really the fastest, so I don't know that they can escape the fire is on foot, um, but we, we will see. Um, we will see how the salamanders are affected over time. Thank you, Victoria. Okay, I'll combine uh, two questions from Sophie and Brandon. Um, they're asking for a copy of the salamander map you shared, and they're also wondering if salamanders can digest some poisonous insects, uh, arachnids or lizards. Hmm. Um, 
I'm not sure. I, I would think that they probably can. I know that when it comes to um, uh, the newts, uh, sometimes they'll eat their own uh, larva. And so if you think about that toxin, uh, it's even in the larva. And so they're able to, to metabolize or, or break down their own toxin. Um, I'm not sure though about, you know, things like maybe like black widows or, or other poisonous insects. I'm not sure what component of their diet that those kinds of things would make up if they did. I know that they definitely prefer earthworms and other slow moving um, invertebrates and um, insects. So maybe it also depends on their ability to capture those things. Um, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that one either. I, I guess I should have started off by saying I am an amphibian enthusiast, but not an expert. I definitely do not know all the answers to these questions. Maybe there's someone out there that does, but I encourage you to, to go look it up on your own as well. All right. So another question from earlier is um, how big are the eggs of arboreal salamander? Can you repeat that? How big are the eggs of the arboreal? Um, they're not very big. I want to, I mean, they're small. I wish I had a picture to show you. There are some pictures online. Um, so these are a bunch of the credits for the photos that I use today. Um, one of the best websites that you can go to is uh, californiahertz.com, uh, California and then herps, H-E-R-P-S.com. And so this is a really great resource um, where there's photos of all of these species in like their aquatic forms with their eggs, um, all sorts of life history information. So if you wanna go to that website, I'm pretty sure there's a photo of an arboreal salamander with its eggs there. They're not very big though, they're, they're small. I don't know how you would quantify like smaller than an M&M. &M. <laughs> um, they're, they're pretty small. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, next question from Stefan. How do salamanders and newts survive the dry season in California if they require moisture? So what they try to do is, uh, is find a, a good hiding place. So um, if you think about uh, pretty much if you go to in the forest and you were to, to dig down a little bit, at some point you're going to be able to find like a little bit of moisture. So uh, these newts are really good at, at finding where those places are. So what, even if it's in like just a, a, a crack that's like really low in the ground or uh, kind of like in the roots of a tree or under rocks, um, usually the forests don't dry like all the way out. You're going to be able to find some little bit of moisture. Um, where they go, like it's still in some ways a mystery, like exactly where they go and how they survive. Um, I think scientists are still trying to figure out um, a lot of newts and salamanders can do this thing called estivate, which is a, a sort of summer hibernation. So um, in some way they're able to find shelter. So, um, but you know, in places where there is absolutely no moisture, like if we think about maybe the future and precipitation patterns, that could be an issue for salamanders. They may be pushed out of their, their ranges and unable to survive. So um, as of right now, most salamanders and newts are able to find some moisture somewhere. Okay, um, let's see. This might be one of the last questions um, from Carolyn. Um, she said that they called newts mud puppies before, but you had them listed as separate. So are there any mud puppies in the Bay Area? No, I don't think there are any mud puppies in the Bay Area. And I, I'm trying to like think of my salamander evolutionary tree. And I want to say that mud puppies, uh, they look kind of like sirens, but they have, uh, so they look kind of eel-like, but they have four legs. And I, I don't think we have any mud puppies in, I don't even know if we have any in California, but I'm not sure. They're, they're, they are different. Mud puppies, they're not um, newts. Want to do one more question? Sure. All okay. right. After land-based salamanders hatch, how long until they reach full size? Oh man, I feel like I wrote that down somewhere. I've looked it up and it definitely depends on the species and I think some of the environmental conditions. Um, I, for the yellow-eyed Encinita, it takes uh, 
a little over 100 days. So anywhere from 100 to I think 113. Um, do I have that written down for anything else? No, I don't have it written down for anything else. It definitely depends from species to species. So um, again, I encourage you to check out that website, californiaherps.com. Um, it breaks it down by species with all of those, those fascinating life history questions, because it definitely, it depends um, from species to species how long. There's a bunch more questions, Victoria. Uh, let's take maybe three more. Three more? Okay. A little bit over. And if, if there are any burning questions that I really didn't get to, to today, feel free to send me an email. Um, I'll do my best to answer them or direct them or direct you to a place where you can uh, find your answer. Okay. Um, a lot of people are asking if they can get um, a copy of, of your sources mm -hmm. and some of your slides. Um, and jo Joy is asking where could um, they get a salamander crossing sign for a hiking trail. Oh, interesting. Um, I'm not sure who who makes salamander crossing signs. I know that the one that is at Lexington Reservoir was funded by the county and uh, roads and airports, I think, installed it. So I don't know. Uh, I don't really know where you could get a new crossing sign made. If anyone out there happens to know and wants to drop you know, the, that website in the chat, uh, feel free to do so. Um, what was the other question? Um, if you can provide um, the sources that you use. Yeah, of course. So uh, if you, uh, I can, when I send out my, my thank you email after this with a link to the survey, I'll uh, copy and paste some of those websites right into the email so that you have them. Um, one question I see from the chat, what is the rarest types? salamander? Oh man, uh, I think it really depends. Uh, there are a lot of species of salamander that are critically endangered. Um, that one that I showed at the beginning, the, uh, the Chinese giant salamander is, is critically endangered and really rare. Um, it's not very commonly found in the wild anymore. Um, there are a lot of photos of them around now because they are actually uh, farmed. They're in China, they actually eat those, uh, the giant salamanders. So unfortunately, that is one of the reasons why their population has experienced decline that in habitat loss. Um, they, re they rely on really clean water in these mountain uh, creeks. And so that, that really isn't around as much anymore. So I think the, the Chinese giant salamander is, is one of the most uh, rare salamanders to find. Let's do one more question from Ellen, because um, maybe a lot of participants can relate to this. Um, do dogs generally avoid the brightly colored toxic newts? What happens if they don't? Um, I think I would hope that they would avoid them. I think that if a if a dog was to to like lick a newt, its tongue would like maybe start to to be tingle tingling, and they you know, would know, I think, pretty immediately not to, to actually eat the whole thing. I don't know if licking it would, would really hurt your pet immediately or not. Um, but, you know, if you're hiking out with your, your pet, just make sure that you have them on a leash and you can see what they're doing or if they're in your backyard. Um, you know, just do your best to watch your pet. I, I, would, I would hope that, you know, your cat or your dog isn't going to eat uh, one of these, these really toxic salamanders. Um, Hopefully the salamander will do its thing, you know, show the coloration and, you know, evolutionarily speaking, hopefully your animal over time has, has somehow learned that it's best to avoid that creature, but I can't speak for all pets. Okay. Do you have a few more questions? Let's see. Where can you find oxycodal? Oxycodal. What was the question about the axolotl? Axolot Sorry, axolotl. It's Where okay. Can you find them? Where can you find them? Where can you find them? Mm -hmm. uh, they're native to somewhere in Mexico or Central America. They, a lot of people have them as pets. Um, you're not, it's not legal to own an axolotl as a pet in California, I'm pretty sure. There are a handful of other states where it's not allowed as well, like I think Maine. 
Um, I don't remember the other states. Uh, there are a lot of salamander restrictions nowadays, especially because of that fungus that I mentioned. So um, it is possible to have certain species of salamanders as pets, but uh, collecting one from the wild is not something that's allowed. So just remember that. I don't remember exactly where in Mexico though. No. I have one more question. Okay. I do have a couple more, but maybe we can end on this one. Um, yeah, if, if, I, if I haven't gotten to your question, feel free to send it, um, respond back to that email that I'm about to send right after this. How long have salamanders been on the earth? Hmm. Oh man, I think the number is like 300 million years, 350 million years. They've been around, modern salamanders essentially have been around for a long time. Uh, the evolutionary story of these sal of amphibians in general is really fascinating um, and very complicated and for me honestly hard to follow. There were some mass extinction events and reptiles at one point really dominated and outcompeted the amphibians and they, you know, didn't have suitable habitat anymore because the planet was too hot and dry. So um, there, there are a lot of scientists that are still trying to figure out, you know, exactly when, uh, you know, amphibians branched into different things. And a lot of it's dependent on fossils too. You know, you never know, maybe there's going to be another fossil that is unveiled and it, you know, is another piece to the mystery, or maybe it raises more questions. But I think the answer is 350 million years ago. Um, if I'm wrong, I'll I'll send out a message or I'll I'll put a subtitle or something over this video recording. All right, we have we do have one more question with Andrew, who's been very patient. If we could answer his question, um, why do salamanders not poison each other and they poison us? Hmm, that's an interesting question. So, uh, so at least when it get, comes to, uh, or like the newts, um, and when they're mating, they're not, uh, they're not gonna to hopefully like eat or really like lick one another so much that they're being ex ingesting that toxin. Um, and if they do, they have some resistance to it. Um, I don't know that a lot of salamanders really interact with other species of salamanders. So it could be that they really just don't come into to contact with one another. They kind of occupy their different uh, places in a, in a habitat. Um, so they're not gonna poison each other that way. Um, the ones that are, are poisonous, um, that's really just to try and defend themselves. So they, there are some salamanders that use other tactics. They might uh, be a biter, they might uh, coil up, they might do different posturing or have mucus that isn't necessarily poisonous. So um, it all just depends on on what in their environment caused them to need to develop that poison as their defense. Um, so that's why some are and some aren't poisonous. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, well, uh, if there, I think there's a couple more, there's a couple more coming yeah. in. Newts look pretty slow and awkward walking on land. Are they more graceful underwater? So when they um, enter the water, they uh, have a more of an aquatic stage. So they lose their, um, their bumps, they become a lot more slippery and their tail actually becomes more like a fin. It becomes kind of flattened. So they definitely are all, are all of a sudden a lot more graceful in the water. Um, yeah, they're not the best uh, movers on land. They definitely are kind of awkward. And this is an interesting question. Do birds eat salamanders? Birds can, yes, eat salamanders. Um, so it just depends on the species and whether or not it's toxic. Um, I did hear that when it comes to uh, certain species of newt, even if they're toxic, uh, I think it was scrub jays have actually, scrub jays are really smart. They're related to crows. Um, they know that the salamander's skin is toxic, but the insides of the salamander are not actually toxic. So I, I read somewhere that scrub, certain, some scrub jays know that if they like 
open the salamander and only eat the guts that they're not gonna um, be poisoned. So, um, but I don't know that that's super widespread. Um, so it just depends. It depends on whether or not the salamander is toxic if a bird's gonna to eat it or not. All right, last question. I love all the that. questions. Thank you so much, everyone, especially okay. everyone that's stuck around. Very good questions from the crowd. So it looks like the last one is from RJ. What's the biggest newt you've seen? Um, biggest newt I've seen was probably, uh, probably about like six inches, maybe a little bit bigger than that. So that's kind of the biggest that they get. I have seen the California giant salamander, uh, which is the giant, the, the biggest salamander that I've ever seen. It was when I was hiking, it was just in the middle of the trail. It was really cool. And that one was probably like 10 or 11 inches. So pretty big. All right, looks like we covered all of the great questions that came in. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining. Again, this we'll try and get this uh, recording up as soon as possible. Uh, so look for it on our uh, County Parks uh, YouTube page. There's also some other programs that are up there as well. So if you missed out on our, our BAT program or our um, Victorian holiday program. There's all sorts of programs and videos that you can go back and watch. So uh, thanks again to everyone for joining. Uh, I hope that you're able to get out into the parks uh, as soon as the rain kind of lets up so that you can get a chance to see maybe some of those newts out on the trail. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day.